Hi, I'm Stacy, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today we're going to be talking about preparing an algorithm for implementation on the FPGA. So you may have something that you want to implement. Maybe it's a calculation or an algorithm and you want to take it and put it on your FPGA. How do you go about doing that? This is what we're going to see today. So this week, for work purposes, I ended up implementing this parson window. And I thought that it would be a really, really interesting window for us to look at. Because it has a few features that are a little bit more complicated and aren't as straightforward as the more basic example that you might see. And windows are typically produced using trig functions like sine and cosine functions. Or usually they require some kind of cordic. But in this window, we don't need that. And that's why this window in particular is quite a nice one for an FPGA because it is quite a nice window in terms of its frequency response, but it's not as nasty as using a cordic in your FPGA. I've got it here. This is the formula for it. And it looks pretty nasty, but there are some things that actually aren't so bad about this. It's not as bad as it looks. And this is what the window looks like in the time domain and the frequency domain. I think the blue line is the Gaussian window and the red line or the orange thicker line is the Parson window. We are taking part of the FPGA and we are dedicating circuitry to that specific function for the entire operation of the FPGA. It's not like a CPU where you can use some resources for one thing and then come back and use them for something else. If I have a specific formula or a specific operation that I'm doing in the FPGA, an FFT or a multiplier or something, that multiplier is going to stay there for the entire time the FPGA is on. This formula has two cases, depending on the n value. And I actually don't care about the cases. I, I can deal with the cases later. The important thing is that both of these need to be implemented in the FPGA at the same time. In parallel, side by side, there's going to be circuitry for this and there's going to be circuitry for this. So the case, the first case has its own circuit and the second case has its own circuit. And then I mux between them depending on the n value. And so I'm going to be ignoring the cases and I'm just going to be splitting the cases up into one function and two functions. So they're a separate function. And then the second thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to replace the divides with a power of two. So n, the capital N divide value must be a power of two. And that turns the divide into a, a right shift. And that's really helpful because then I don't have to put a divide in my FPGA. Divides are not nice. I think I've done a divide in an FPGA a handful of times. I just shift in this case by n minus one, which is the equivalent of dividing by n divided by two. This calculation n over capital N divided by two, I'm just going to call that little thing b and I'm going to calculate it once and then I'm going to use it in all the different places it needs to be used. And so if I substitute my b value in, I get these two equations. Now I turn my attention to the cubics. I can do a b cubed. It's just b times b times b and I have multiplied. So that's not so bad. But what I would like to do is I would like to use the b cubed here instead of having to do one minus b and then cubing that as well. I don't want to have to do b cubed and one minus b cubed. So I'm going to expand out the one minus b cubed into the polynomial expansion. And so that way I get myself, even though it's longer, I can reuse my b cubed now. Instead of having to do 1 minus b cubed, I can use the b cubed. And I'm going to create b, and then from b, I'm going to create b squared. And from b squared and b, I'm going to create b cubed. So here we have the stages of what I need. I need b, which I will calculate from my counter values. Then I have b squared, which is b times b, which is 1 multiply. And then b cubed, which is b squared times b, which is the second multiply. My timing goal is going to be one multiply per clock cycle because these are going to be 16 bit multiplies. The first clock cycle is going to calculate b, the second b squared, the third b cubed. And so then I have b, b squared, b cubed all lined up. And then on the fourth clock cycle, I'm going to implement all my scalars. So I need to multiply b squared by six in both cases. So then I create my six b squared. And then I'm going to create my 2b cubed and my 6b cubed and my 6b. And so this fourth clock cycle is going to be creating 
all of the scaled versions of B. And I can do that all in one clock cycle because they'll all happen in parallel and because I'm multiplying by scalars, so those aren't that resource intensive. And then the next clock cycle, I'm going to build my formulas. 1 minus 6B squared plus 6B cubed. 2 minus 6B plus 6B squared minus 6B cubed. I'm going to build my polynomials together and create the final two values, the one case result and the other case result. And then on the sixth clock cycle, I'm going to choose between my result one and my result two, depending on the case. It's basically just a counter that counts down and counts up again. And depending on what part of it you're on, you can choose between case one and case two. And that's it. So in summary, what I do, look at where the divides are, and I try to remove the divides as much as possible, or replace them with powers of two, or if you offload them to a CPU. And then the second thing I do is I try and find out the common parts of the equation, times where the same value is used over and over and over again, and I minimize my multipliers if it's a square or a cube by doing that square value once and then use all over the place. And then what I do is I break it down to one multiply per clock cycle. And then from those key values in my formula, I will build my result. So this works really well with polynomials. As you can see, whatever your order of your polynomial is, and then you scale everything as you need and build everything together. And that works really well for polynomials in the FPGA. And that's it. In my next video, I'm going to go over the code for this to show you what this looks like in practice when it's implemented. I hope that this is helpful to you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I appreciate you. Thank you for your time and I'll see you next time. Bye!